Anyway, isn't that great? So that's from a movie called Inside Out. You know, we've all met somebody who has anger issues. I don't know if you've ever dealt with that when you're talking to somebody. One of our members this week uh, um, basically said something to someone and immediately they went from normal person to angry person. How many of you have ever had that happen? Isn't that fun? And how many of you have ever been in traffic in Miami? Oh, never mind, I'm not going to. All right, so, so anger has a purpose. You know, the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin, which means it has a purpose. And, and part of the purpose of anger, for example, when you're driving, it's natural when somebody cuts you off or you feel like they're going to attack you to have anger. And part of the reason for that is self-protection. Okay, but it's not to take your car and ram into them or hit your brakes when they're tailgating. Right, right, right. So you that passive aggressive or if you're Italian, aggressive, aggressive thing. Um, you know, I always joke, you know, Irish, uh, uh, I'm, I'm way back uh, Irish and uh, uh, we are professional passive aggressive people. So we die of heart attacks. Italians are just aggressive. So they die of other things. But uh, anyway, so, you know, here's the thing. So we look at Moses we look at these verses. By the way, we're going to get to heaven, and we're going to meet Moses, and he's going to be like, I wish I looked like Charlton Heston. Just so you know, he's going to, he's going to let us know that. But uh, uh, he, he, apparently, he was pretty good looking from what I, I know. But anyway, here's the series verse just to give you a little heads up about Moses, and we'll be repeating this one every week. Could you guys make more noise with that plastic over there? Maybe, maybe why don't you just get like some pop bubble pop and... Um, but I want you to eat. I want you to eat. Go enjoy your enjoy it. It's good. But you're making me jealous. That's what this is all about. But all right. Michelle, could you wrap it in like paper instead? <laughs> David's so mad at me now. All right, here we go. So the Lord said to him, what, what is that in your hand? You know, this is the bad part about it being an ADD pastor because I just ruin everybody's life. And then later I have to apologize for being a doofus and the things that just I blurt out of my head. It's just really, it's not on purpose. It's not on purpose, but I do love you. And the praise team did do an awesome job today, as usual, don't they? And David has great reason to be proud in these people. All right. He said, leave me alone. Get back to the sermon. All right. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And we've heard, I've heard sermons preached on that. A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Okay. And people love to preach a sermon on that. I want to give you the whole context. Moses threw it on the ground. It became a snake. And he ran from it. Now, the reason I wanted both those verses is this. Listen, Moses was an imperfect human that God used in a powerful way. Moses had anger issues. Moses had insecurity issues. Moses had stuttering issues. He had other issues. He had issues trusting God sometimes. But God used Moses in a mighty way. The word holy means to be set apart. And so we're doing a series called Holy Moses. Why? Moses was set apart for God's purposes. Now, I want you to know something today. We're going to get to the message in a minute. But here's the big deal about why Moses could do what God wanted him to do, even though he was an imperfect, messed up person. See, being a perfect church for imperfect people doesn't mean that we encourage you to try to be imperfect. We all understand that imperfection comes naturally. It's striving to be holy that's difficult. And so here's what I want you to know. If you don't remember anything else today, remember this, and then you can take a nap. If you're watching online and you're getting a little comfortable now, your eyes are fading. By the way, a couple people wanted us to know they're watching from Coco and Friday Road and a few other places. So we're thankful for all of you watching. So There is no restoration without repentance. God uses all kinds of people in Scripture. But we've got to get past this idea that we're all just messed up, so just be whoever you are. No, no, no. We need repentance. Repentance is that 180 that we need in our lives. And I may have told you last week about the man who came to me and said, Pastor, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to turn a 360. Don't turn a 360. You're exactly where you were if you turn a 360. 180, 180. You want to do a 180, not a 360. And so Moses does a 180, but first he starts out with some pride that gets in the way. Now, have you, if you grew up in Florida, you've seen these gigantic, enormous pine cones. How many of you have seen these? 
Now, if you grew up in Florida, I also have to ask you this question. How many of you also at one time had a pine cone fight with these evil, sharp pine cones? Now, if you haven't had one of those yet, you have not had the fun of being a Floridian and gone in your house with scratches on your arms and legs and maybe on your face if you had a really mean brother or cousin or whoever you were fighting with. But in Florida, you would go and gather these in piles and then you would have a pine cone fight. Does that sound about right, Carl? You get the... The green ones are worse, yes, before they open. Oh, see, he was one of those guys. Now you know. So, so you get hit. Yeah, those do hurt more. So, so, but you get hit one of these, they scratch you up. These open, and, and Florida, God has made these things amazing. By the way, if you never noticed, the seeds in a pine cone, God made them where they're little helicopters. And so they helicopter out, and fires a lot of times will open them up, all kind of stuff. But anyway, so you get in a fight with these, you start throwing them, and you know what happens after a few minutes? You get hit by one, it hurts a little too much, and then suddenly, you know what rises up in you? Anger, and your pine cone fight might go to a wrestling match or a fist fight. Why? Because you got hurt, and so you respond in a way that's not good. You go in anger. We've all had those moments of anger. See, one of the easy things about this sermon is to look and think of somebody who's an angry person, but not recognize the anger and pride that can happen in us. So today we're going to give three truths about pride fighting. Instead of prize fighting, it's pride fighting. We do this. And here's what I want you to know. Your pride and your anger will ruin your relationships. It can ruin your career. We all know people who've ruined their career because they got prideful. They did dumb things because they thought they were better than they were. Or they just thought they were above. Everybody else could do whatever they want. But it can also make you run from God. When God doesn't answer your prayers the way he want, you want him to. When somebody dies that you prayed earnestly for. When life is difficult and maybe you struggle with a sickness or a difficulty in your life, and you start to say, God, let me tell you how you need to handle this. By the way, I'm really good at giving God advice. If you didn't know that about your pastor, that's one of my, my biggest weaknesses. I like to tell God, you know, God, it'd be nice if this had just happened. It'd make it a lot easier on everybody. God's not into easy, by the way. I have noticed that. I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to figure that one out. And I want to encourage you to also know that even if you're one of the people that's like Moses, and you have blown it, and you have messed up. That God uses restored people after they repent. And when you go through scripture over and over, listen, there are people who blow it, and then God doesn't use them. You know why? Because they don't repent. But over and over, even the first five books of the Old Testament are written by a guy who murdered somebody. So I want you to think about today those times that pride sneaks into your life. So here we go. Number one. Why do we get prideful? Because we forget that many people helped us. You did not get to where you are by accident. You, you had people help you along the way, teach you something, you know about something, whether it's working on cars or working as an engineer. Somebody poured into your life. Moses forgot that. But here's what happened in Exodus 2, verse 4 through 10. They were killing all the babies by this time, by the way. And so Moses' parents, in Hebrews it says, they saw that he was special. So they sent him on a river raft ride. Right? His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbanks. Now, attendants would walk along the riverbanks because they wanted to make sure there wasn't like a crocodile or some other animal coming to find you while you were in the Nile. So they, she had people watching out for her. And then it says, she saw the basket among the reeds. And I love this. She sent her female slave to get it. Do you, do you, I want you to just think of the imagery here. I don't know about you, but even if you're in a kayak and all of a sudden the wind pushes you into the reeds, if you've been a Floridian very long, when you're in the reeds, you know what you start to do? Get me out of the reeds. So what does Pharaoh's daughter do? Hey, uh, you know where the alligators and, or where the crocodiles hang out? I, just, I want you to go over there and get that. And so that's what she did. Nobody, they don't even question it. So she sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. I love this. He was crying. And she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Now notice, 
she notices he either looks Hebrew, he's wearing something Hebrew, or she's just figured out this baby's not just floating down this river for no reason. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went, and listen to this, got Moses' mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take the baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. Now, this is awesome. None of you have ever had this happen. You have a baby, and somebody says, I will pay you to nurse your own baby. This is how good God is. Not only does she walk in faith and send Moses down and have to take that action of faith to, to have that happen, now, when the sister brings the baby back to the house, imagine that moment, and then the sister, and she's like, oh, I'm so thankful to have the baby. And she said, oh, yeah, and by the way, you're on salary now for Pharaoh. Uh, only God is that good. And then it continues. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he, listen, became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So that means that Pharaoh now is grandpa. They're all related. And so you've got this whole uh, uh, thing worked out where God has put all of this together, Moses is now part of Pharaoh's house. Now, what does that mean? That means that Moses at this time gets the best education in the world. By the way, we still marvel today at things the Egyptians did, the engineering that they did, the culture that they had, the writing that they developed. They developed some of the first paper so basically, they were the first paper and pen. Why would that be useful? Because God knew that his word was going to be written. And the first five books, which the Jewish people consider the most important, is called the Pentateuch. The first five books of the Old Testament, written by this guy Moses, who would not have gotten where he had unless his parents took a step of faith. Unless his sister followed Unless Pharaoh's daughter had pulled him out, and then all of the teachers, all of the people who taught him, all of the things he learned. By the way, his mother also taught him what it meant to be Jewish. And so he not only learned that, but he learned the ways of the Egyptians and all of the things they knew how to do. As we talk the next few weeks, and I'll throw in some facts about Egypt, you're going to see how God used this as the perfect time, as usual, and the perfect place for God to work his will. Moses forgot who he was and where he came from. You and I can forget that too. A few weeks ago, I was thinking about this idea of thanking those who've helped you. And I decided to write a letter to a pastor. His name's Peter Lord. To just say, because I like to talk to him on the phone, but he can't hear me. So it's frustrating for him and I can tell that. So I decided I'll just write a letter and thank him for all the years he poured into my life. And I thought I'm just going to do that and send him a letter. This weekend, I got a call that he's in hospice care. And I thought, you know, and I don't know what that means, because that means different things for different people. But I thought, you know, I'm so glad that I took a moment to do this. Hey, I want to challenge you to do something this week. I don't care if it's a teacher who helped you, a parent that helped you, somebody else. Who helped. I want you to take a minute or two this week. And by the way, I got a wonderful note this week uh, from some folks that are here this morning saying how much they enjoy our church and what God's doing in their lives. So take a minute and write somebody, thank them for what they poured into your life. Whether it was they taught you something, showed you something, they were an example to you. This morning I sent a text to somebody and I said, I just want you to know I learned this from you and your husband who's passed away. And I want you to know that we are applying that in our lives. Just to say thank you. So take some time this week to do it. It's very humbling. Did you know that Mr. Rogers used to do that with groups of people? He'd make them very uncomfortable. But he would stop whatever. And he did it at a conference one time, a big conference. And he said, we're gonna, and we're not going to do it this morning. It's very uncomfortable. He said, we're going to take a minute and think of the people who got to you where you were, whether it was parents or somebody. And, and he would stop what he was doing. And he just had people think on that for a minute. It's very humbling when you realize I'm where I am because God brought other people into my life to change me. So take some time to do that this week. All right, so not only do we forget people help us, what happens with us? We become impatient and sin. I would love to tell you as a generation that we are becoming more and more patient. But we are not. We're becoming less and less patient. Right? Do you remember 
was that thunder I just heard? <laughs> do you, do you, I'm very ADD today. You're just going to have to forgive me or enjoy it or be mad. One of the three things. I don't know which. But anyway, so what happened? So we used to get on AOL. Now, this isn't even that long ago, right? And you would go in and you'd open your AOL and you'd click the button. And then you'd hear, remember that? How many of y'all remember that? Yep, you're showing your age, right? And then it would say, you've got mail. And you're like, I got mail. And then you'd sit there. Pop up one, and you try to click on it, and you're like, oh, it's not. And pop up another. And then whatever, they were telling you your, your car warranty ran out, or whatever in there, right? You think that's new. And then finally, you'd click on your email. It would take forever. Now, we're in our house. We go into a room, and we say, I don't have internet in this room. This whole house internet's not where I want internet here. How about when we push print? And the printer doesn't have paper. And we go running in there like it's some national crisis. I can't believe this thing does not have paper. I just, oh, I thought I just put paper in. I mean, do you hear us? The pizza guy's five minutes late. Amazon took three days. Right? Randy gets jealous of me sometimes. I got to tell this story. So, so Randy will say, Eric, can you order this piece part for the church? So I'll order something. Four hours later, I'll text him. Hey, they brought it up. Somebody in a Prius showed up at my house, ran to my door, and threw something on the driveway and ran back out. And it was our order. I ordered it four hours ago. That's when you live in the big city of Chuliota. I mean, these people, I don't know. I think somebody's like waiting at Amazon. And go. And I mean, hours. And yet sometimes when it takes an extra day, I'm like, where is that package? Isn't that amazing how far we've come? We have lost our patience because we think things should move faster. And hey, how about when it has to do with God's will? Now here, Moses is now 40 years old. And listen to what happens next. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. Time out. Notice Moses isn't working, he's watching. Why? Because positionally, he's up here. He's a manager now. You ever met a manager who forgot who he was? <laughs> that was a little bit too much of a reaction. That was pretty great. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that and seeing no one. By the way, when you're going to sin, that's what it looks like. You look this way and that. He knew what he was doing wasn't right. He killed the Egyptian, hit him in the sand. Now, Moses, because he knew that God had called him, felt like, this is the time, I see an injustice, I'm going to deal with it, and the next day he thinks it's going to be his Napoleon Dynamite moment, where he does the dance and everybody cheers. I don't, if you haven't seen that movie, that's all you need to know. Moses thinks that he's going to come out and they're going to be like, Moses, you are taking care of us, but that's not what happens. Listen to what happens next. He saw two Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler or judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard this, listen, Grandpa tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Do you hear the turn of events because of one moment of anger and impatience? Do you hear what happened? Now, God knew all this. God used all this in his life. But the truth is, Moses made a really bad mistake. And I think Moses, when he sat down at this well in Midian, had to think, it's over. I'm done. This is it. See, when you, are, when you become to the point where you start to expect things all the time, you and I can become spoiled. And so when God doesn't work on our timeline, we think, well, what's wrong with him? Moses is now 40. He had to be thinking, it's got to be about time. This is midlife for me, maybe longer back then, right? And yet God wasn't ready yet, but Moses was. So he ends up running. Everything crashes down around him. Moses had to think everything was over. Here's my second challenge to you. 
Ask God to forgive you for the times you don't trust him. The times that you think God should have done something that he didn't do. The time that you maybe ended up somewhere you shouldn't have ended up. And maybe it was even your own choice. In Moses' case, Moses blew it. He sinned. He messed up. So we forget people helped us. We become impatient and sin. Number three, God renews the humble. Now remember, there's no renewal without repentance. This is what you need to understand. David blew it in Scripture and repented. Moses blew it in Scripture. He repented. Peter, who denied Christ, repented. Saul blew it and didn't repent. He blamed other people. Guess who God used the most? Big Saul or little David? Little David. Why? Because there was repentance. There's a big difference between somebody who's repentant and somebody who continues to pursue sin and says, well, I'm messed up. This is just what I do and who I am. Big difference. If you want God to use you, you have to repent. That means turn around. Ask forgiveness. Now, a priest of Midian had seven daughters. Now, you've got to realize this guy's state of mind. By the way, priest of Midian probably was familiar uh, uh, because it was a branch of Abraham, was probably familiar with God, but most likely worshipped many gods. Just so you know that right here. Later, we know that he adopted the God of Israel, but at this point, he probably did not. He had seven daughters. I just want to say that one more time. He had seven daughters. And as a dad, he was responsible for providing for all these daughters. I'm going to tell you why I'm pointing that out in just a second. And they came to draw water, fill the troughs of, to water their flocks. So they had to fill these big troughs. This was a heavy-duty job. You had to pull up water. You had to carry the water. We're not talking just a gallon jug of milk. We're talking, you know, 20 gallons, 30 gallons, 40 gallons of water at a time. Can you imagine? And you're dumping that out to feed your flocks. So these women are doing that. But some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up, came to their rescue, and watered their flock. You know what that tells me? That Moses must have been pretty strong. Because there was a group of shepherds that showed up and wouldn't let these women get water. And Moses showed up and said, we're getting water. And they said, yes, we are. And Moses waters their flocks. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian. See, they were early. Why? Because Moses was able to water their flocks quickly too, showing his strength. An Egyptian, by the way. Moses looked like an Egyptian now. He had his sh head shaved. He wore perfume. I'm sure he had had facials his whole life. You know, before he looked like a, like a Jewish child. And now he looks like an Egyptian. He was probably dressed like an Egyptian. He may have still been wearing makeup. We don't know. Right? And so they said an Egyptian came... And rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And here's the dad's response immediately. Where is he? Seven daughters. Just... <laughs> Ruel asked his daughters, why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. I love this. Moses stayed with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah, which sounds like Zippo lighter, and to Moses in marriage. And then Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I've become a foreigner in a foreign land. What was God doing? God was preparing Moses for what he was going to do. But you'll notice Moses was humble. How do I know that? Because Moses noticed the needs of other people. Just like Joseph had many years before in the middle of trial, here Moses was dejected, being chased, somebody wanted to murder him. I don't know if you've had that kind of day before. And yet Moses saw somebody who was being hurt and said, I'm going to protect them, which is exactly what God was preparing for Moses to do again for the next 40 years. In Matthew 23, Jesus says this, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what mistakes you've made. You've probably made a couple, maybe one or two, right? You may feel like God can't use you. You may feel like you've blown it too much and God just can't use you anymore. Listen, I want you to do this next thing. In humility, 
Look for what God wants you to do next. Now, that requires repentance. It may mean admitting you failed. It may mean if you can, if it doesn't hurt them, that you actually apologize to people that you've hurt, that you bring restitution to things that you've stolen or taken. But when we humble ourselves and say, you know what, God, even though I'm flawed, even though I'm messed up, even though I've done things that I know are wrong, some on purpose, some on accident, right? God, show me what you want me to do next. Ask God to open your eyes to the people around you who need you. One of the neat things I got to do yesterday was pick up trash. And I got to go to a provost park over here, not too far from this church. And while we were there picking up trash, I got to meet the mayor of the city of Coco. Didn't know who it was. He's very tall. I'm very short. And we were talking about different things. And one of the things he said to me is, I can't wait to get, because I was telling him about things our church did and how we want to help in the community. And he said, well, I, I know that we've got a place we can come to. And I said to him, I want you to know if you need something from our church, even if you just want to have city employees park here to relax at lunchtime, whatever you need, and we have good coffee, call me and we'll help you. And he said, I love to have a partner in the community. God's done that at this church, and I know he'll do that with you everywhere you go. Every place you put your foot, God will open opportunities for you. Don't let your pride and anger ruin you. If you have ruined relationships, repent. If you have ruined your career, repent. If you have run from God, repent. Turn 180 and come home. And the prodigal father is waiting on the doorstep to see you coming down the road. And because you make those first steps, he runs towards you and restores you. So if you're here today or you're watching online and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. And so if you want to talk about what it means to be a Christian, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, loved you, that he gave his one and only son. He sent Jesus. Why? Because we're sinners. That whoever believes, whoever puts their faith in him, I believe you died on a cross and rose again to pay for my sins. I surrender my life to you. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life begins when you surrender your life to him. If you want to have that relationship, I'd love to talk to you about what that means. Maybe you want to take that next step of baptism. Maybe you're a Christian and you've struggled with some of these things. Hey, just be honest with God. He loves you right where you are. We normally have our time of offering here. If you're in the room here, you can drop your offering on the way out or you can give online. Those who are watching online can give online. There's, uh, you can give on our website. You can give through Facebook. There's all kind of ways to give. But you do what God's called you to do today. But more important than all of that is that you would turn your heart towards God today and just let him examine you. Go out of your way to be a blessing and even write that letter or that email or that text today to somebody who's gotten you to where you are. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these moments. Lord, thank you that even in my distraction, uh, Lord, even when I fail to stay focused, that you even use that. And I'm grateful that you use imperfect, messed up people. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you that even when we're broken, even when we're not the way we want to be, that you use us anyway. Father, thank you that you don't wait for perfection to use us. You just wait for a humble heart. So, Lord, we all humble ourselves before you as a church. We ask that you would use not only us, but use our church to be a blessing, a lighthouse in this community, to bring people who are far from you home to you. Lord, I pray if anyone here is watching or watching online or out in the parking lot, Father, that today would be the day that they surrender their lives to you for eternity. They give their whole life and their whole heart to you. We thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.